Give me a green light whenever you're ready. Cool. Good to go. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. You are here for From Blue to Red, What Matters and What Really Doesn't. My name is Jason Lang. Uh, before we start, before we get any further than anything, I want to talk about goals because it sounds like there's a really awesome talk on track up or down. I, I don't remember. Uh, Met Metasploit. Uh, that ex moving beyond Metasploit. That one actually looks really cool as well. So, But before we do that, I want to tell you about goals. What exactly this talk is about and what it's not about. That way, if you want to move on, you have time to do that. So the first thing is to give you career perspective. And what I mean by that is I'm going to tell you a little bit about my InfoSec career, having been an enterprise defender for a long time and then recently switching over into enterprise offense, uh, doing pen testing full time. So uh, I've had a very we'll call it an enlightening, uh, very interesting career shift. So I'm going to talk about that. Um, in that journey, uh, I've learned some interesting things about what really works against attackers, determined attackers, and what does not. Um, having worked in a Fortune 500, spent millions and millions of dollars on security controls, some of them work, and some of them really, really, really don't work, and we're going to get into that. Uh, I want to tell you about, uh, likewise, controls worth investing in, in my humble opinion. Some of you might disagree with me, and that's fine. Uh, I want to give you solid advice for those of you wishing to get into penetration testing or offensive security. Pay attention to the green check mark. I hope you can see it in the back. Uh, if you see the green check mark, those are my personal tips to you for making a career shift if that is what you're interested in. And then the last thing that I want to give you is hope. And this is important. Uh, uh, the reason why it's important is because I, you, know, you, you, go to, you go to cons and it's like, you get up there and these guys and they're like, our industry sucks and your security sucks and you suck and I stole all your data. And, Talks like that just kind of drive me nuts. So I actually asked a friend of mine, an enterprise defender, I said, if there was one goal, if there's one thing you would want to say to other enterprise defenders, what would it be? And, and he said, don't leave them hopeless. And that's really important. So I am going to talk about attacks that we use. In fact, I'm going to talk about attacks that we used two weeks ago and attacks that I'm going to use next week uh, on my engagement coming up. Okay, but I, in, that, in describing that, I do not want to leave you hopeless. So just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been doing InfoSec for about 10 years, uh, full time. Um, I'm currently with a company called Centercom. We're based out of Brookfield, Wisconsin. So my, my current job is full time penetration testing, internal, external vulnerability assessments, et cetera. Uh, specialties, uh, before working at Centercom, I worked at a Fortune 500 company where I was uh, one of the domain administrators for 20,000 users, a very, very large environment. Um, Active Directory and development are definitely two of my passions. Uh, hobbies, uh, woodworking and fly fishing. Um, I'm not one of those guys that likes to geek out all day long. I like to fish. I like to push a jack plane. So that's what I enjoy doing. So before we get into content too much, I want to survey you guys because knowing what you do is going to help me help you. So how many of you work in a large enterprise? Large meaning we'll say 5,000 users plus. Okay, the, the majority of you, that's, that's what I was saying, that's, that's really good to know. How many of you work in an enterprise defense role? Doesn't necessarily, and that, that, that could be all kinds of things. I'm painting very, very broad strokes. Okay, so the, the majority of you. How many of you are interested in working in an offensive role? Potentially switching. All right, cool. Yeah, yeah, a lot of you. Why? It's cool. It's sexy, right? I mean, everybody wants to do that. So how many of you would consider at least 50% of your day in your enterprise to be productive? Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Why? Why is this? I'm going to tell you why. Because if you work in an enterprise defense role, your day starts, you can't even see that, 1 o'clock in the morning. Why, is this, why, does your, why, why does it start at 1 o'clock in the morning? Hi, I'm Jason. Come on in. No, no, it's cool. <laughs> why does it start at 1 o'clock in the morning? Because you're on call. Right? So you're on call. So your pager, shoot, your, pager, your phone, your phone starts ringing, pager. Anyways, so your, your phone starts ringing, and there's a major outage. So you get up, you spend a couple hours working on this outage, and you go back to bed about 3 o'clock. Okay, your, your actual alarm goes off. You drag yourself out of bed, okay, for the morning, pick me up, right? And then you, you, you down as much coffee as you can. You, you slowly go into work, all right? You take your time. Why? Because you've been up for a while. So you get into work, and then you're it's like 10 o'clock meeting, right? First things first. You got to have meetings, right? This, this is enterprise defense. Okay, so you've had a crappy day from the start. You're all hopped up on coffee, and you think to yourself, hey, I deserve it, right? So you take, you take the long lunch, right? Everybody's done it. Nobody high rode me on this. Some people are like, no, I don't do it. <laughs> Whatever, yeah, you do. Everybody does that, right? So you, you go take your long lunch. You come back from long lunch for more of this, all right? More meetings, right? You barely make it through the 1 o'clock meeting, and then it's time for the 2 p.m. pick-me-up, okay? 
So you head to the store, you go grab some Starbucks. There, there's always one guy in the crowd who's crying because I'm describing his life, <laughs> right? So you go to the 2 and pick me up. While you're getting your coffee, what happens? Some of this, you, you, got, you got project managers you got to deal with, right? So the PMs are, you know, they're, they're saying, they, what, what's the status on this project? How many of you have five or more active projects right now? Yeah, 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 absolutely, of course, right? Okay, so you're getting hit up all the time for this. Meanwhile, there's a crisis going on. So, so, so you get paged again, okay? It could be the same thing, could be a different thing, it doesn't matter. It's another crisis going on. So you solve the crisis. You stroll in, your security, right? It, we have an SSO problem, you fix it, okay? You stroll out, you spend the rest of the day killing time on Google, because again, you've earned it, right? So you finish out your day, you go home, if you're lucky, you get a little bit of family time, you shuttle the kids off to bed, and then it's on to this. Right? And, and this, this was honestly my life for eight years. Not so much the bourbon, I, I love bourbon, but you know, not, not, not every day, I'm not an I'm alcoholic, but anyways. So uh, th this, this is what I did for eight years. Okay, and the problem is that in that time, it is really, really, really easy for several, it, it, it's, uh, I don't wanna describe this, your passion can rust. Okay, your perspective can rust, all right? You, you, you get stuck doing the same thing, implementing technology and then supporting technology, maybe customizing that technology, okay? Working with vendors, et cetera, et cetera, that you begin to lose perspective. It's really, really easy to lose perspective working in InfoSec, especially working in an InfoSec in an enterprise defense role. Okay, so I'm, I'm in this chair. This was actually, uh, I made the transition about a year ago. I'm in this chair and, and a friend of mine uh, actually said to me, Jason, you should go get this. Defense and Security Certified Profession. Everybody know, everybody know what this is, OSCP? So this, is, uh, uh, this exam is uh, put out by a company called Defense and Security. It is a completely, it is a skills-based exam. Uh, what you do is you get into a lab environment. You have 50 machines that you can hack every which kind of way. There is no multiple choice. And then the actual exam before you get the certification is uh, you have to, you have 24 hours to uh, exploit and gain admin on five different systems. Okay, so it's completely skills-based, all right? So this is not a CISSP, FYI. So he, he told me this, actually, I'm, I'm gesturing to Hebe because in the audience, Scott, laser pointer right there. So uh, he, he told me to do this, and I'm like, you know what? I, I had this perspective of what hackers were, all right? I'm like, hackers are like just a bunch of geeks who like wear their black hoodies and play World of Warcraft in their mom's basement in China. I mean, I, I was racist about it, I admit. So, and then, you know, but something interesting happened at that time. And what that interesting thing was is that we had an internal penetration test. Remember, I'm working in enterprise defense. We had an internal penetration test. And I'm one of the guys responsible for Active Directory. How many of you have ever had an internal pen test? Okay, a couple of you. So, so what, what is, the, what is the, that pen tester most likely going to do or gain during that time? Domain administrative access. Okay, and that's exactly what happened. So we hired a company, TrustedSec. Everybody knows what TrustedSec is. So, so we, we hired TrustedSec, and I get a phone call saying, hey, Jason, you want to go check out the domain admins group? So I look at domain admins group and I see this. I see a trusted stack account that is a member of domain admins. And I was furious, okay? All, all we started them with was they just had a little black box that was connected in one of our network jacks, all right? A few days goes by, a few more days goes by, nothing, I don't see anything in the logs, and then, and then this happens. And so that, that moment, if I had to put if I had to uh, 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 put the spotlight on any one moment in my career, it would be this moment when I actually observed this as an enterprise defender, just kind of in the cogs. I, I didn't even work with uh, the people who are selling our business uh, every day, much less work with customers. I was so embedded into IT security that I had lost track of what was really important. And then something like this happened. This created something very, very important. If you are, if you are considering switching into pen testing or even in your day-to-day -day job, curiosity is absolutely critical for what you do. And, I, and I'll tell you this, if you're not a curious person, if you're not, boy, I just, I wonder how this, how this badge works. This badge is awesome. How do you know, this solder connections. If this does not interest you, uh, stay away from pen testing. It, it is, it's not the career for you, okay? If you enjoy cranking widgets and you enjoy unlocking accounts and you enjoy going through spreadsheets, stay doing that, okay? But if, if you're thinking to yourself, I really would, I'm, I'm interested in moving into this offensive role, you need to be a curious person. Okay, so this, th that, that event right here, that triggered curiosity in me, a very, very intense curiosity, something that I had long forgotten about. I was just in the day-to-day -day grind, okay? I wanted to know, how were all of our controls so easily bypassed? We had implemented millions of dollars 
worth of security controls. And in, and in a couple of weeks, they, they were just skirted around. And I'm like, how, how did that happen? How, how, did, how, did this, how did this tester get around our controls? How can we prevent it from happening again? And then most importantly, the question that actually kept me up at night, what did they know as an attacker that I did not know as a defender? What were they using? What were they doing? What tools did they have access to that I had no idea even existed? Remember, I'm embedded into security. And I, I, this was a world that I was completely distant from. I had no idea it existed. Remember, I think hackers are in China. I think hackers use zero days. That's it. That, that's, that was literally what my perspective was. Okay, so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll take the OSCP. I'll take the exam. So I, I jumped in, just like, like a little kid, because I had no idea what I was getting into. Okay, and actually, after about 400 hours of time spent in the lab and at least one exam retake, I passed. Okay, and I, I, I noticed some really, really interesting trends. And I'm going to describe these trends. Here. These are trends that I learned actually exploiting systems in, in the lab. Okay, I'm going to tell you about these trends, and I, and I all but guarantee they're not going to surprise you. Okay, number one, 95% of unauthorized access comes from those three categories. System and security misconfigurations, putting passwords into config files. Okay, you're not patching your stuff. And finally, failure to follow least privilege. These three things I really do think comprise the vast majority of attack avenues that breaches come from. Those three things. And like I said, it's not going to surprise you. If you've gone, if you've listened, been to any security conference and gone and listened to any security talk, you have heard variations of, of this concept. Okay. But like I said, this was new to me. And the reason why it was new to me is because I was focused on Active Directory. I wasn't focused on it getting into an environment. I was focused on making sure all my DCs were up and running. Okay, I was, I was uh, doing PKI administration. I was, folk, I was uh, making sure that RCA was issuing certificates and that the certs that were expiring, we were revoking, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that kind of stuff. That's what I was totally focused on, not, in my opinion now, what really mattered to our company and, to, and, and in our company's best interest. Okay, second thing that I learned, this is a lot of fun. This is a lot of fun. Hacking stuff, just breaking stuff, going in and laying waste and, you know, owning systems. Yeah, I loved it. Okay, and I hadn't loved much of anything about my job except for the people in a really long time. Okay, second point, you got to love what you do. Third point, a diverse IT background helps tremendously. I'll give you a summary slide at the very end of all these tips and tricks. Okay, a diverse IT background helped tremendously. I hadn't just been doing Active Directory. I did database design. I, I had programming, all, all kinds of stuff, all around IT. All right, and there's actually an interesting story about this. Uh, my, my company, Cinecom, we actually put on a presentation for uh, an ethical hacking class in one of our local technical colleges. And so we got a, we got a bunch of kids who come in, kids, they're, they're in their 20s, a bunch of kids who come in, they sit down just like this, right? And we describe latest attacks. We, we have a little shop set up where they can play with some of our hacking gear, okay? And, and we go through our presentation. At the very end, one kid comes up to me, all right? And, and here's how he comes up to me, and, and I'm not making this up. I'm sitting there, just working my laptop, and I see this. <sighs> and he's depressed. He's really depressed. And he looks at me, and he has a question for me. And I'm like, hi, I'm Jason. He's like, hi. And, and he, he said, I just have one question. He's like, how do I not be a noob? That was it. That was his only question. And, and my first thought... <laughs> I, I want to tell me, like, dude, that is the most noobish thing you could have done in that moment, was ask me how to not be noob. But anyways, so, so he asked me that. And, and here's the thing. He was totally serious about it. And I thought, I, I feel like a noob every single day learning about new stuff. So who am I to turn this kid away? All right. And so I told him, I said, what, what, what's your problem? What are you trying to solve? He's like, I don't know where to begin. All right. I'm taking this ethical, ethical hacking class. I, I don't know where to start. And I said, well, what do you like? He's like, everything. I said, okay. I said, how about this? Networking, infrastructure, development, databases. Which one do you just go to? He said, networking. I said, okay. Uh, switches, cabling, or Wi-Fi? He's like, switches and routers. I love that stuff. I said, perfect. You got it. Now you know what you like. Okay, now you know what you're interested in. I said, go there. Don't, don't try and just get around the IT background that you need to have in order to be a good pen tester. I said, Start in networking. If networking is what you love, get a job running cable. And you're going to be excited about that job. And people are going to notice that excitement. And they're going to be like, hey, you want to install some switches? Yeah, sure, I'll install switches. Why? Because you love it. You're excited. You want to do that stuff. If you're stuck in a job that you hate, chances are you suck at that job. 
Okay, so find something that, that you enjoy and move into that realm. doesn't necessarily matter what it is, but start small, move into that realm, and then expand because your passion will carry you. Okay, and so for me, I had found that I, what I was really, really, really interested in, and that was pen testing. I, I, I loved it. I, going through OCP was outstanding, so I switched jobs. I had a nice pension. I had stayed there for a while. I knew everybody at the company, and I'm like, you know what? Time to start over. I got three kids. You know what? We're going to start over. So switch jobs. Uh, through a friend of a friend, I got a job at Centercom, and that's when I started uh, uh, pen testing. So they, they signed me up with my, with my first gig. And at, at Centercom, we have a service offering that we call a bad employee test. Bad employee test is where uh, y- you hire us, we, we, we go into your building, uh, we sit down at a computer, and you give us like low privilege credentials. So we, we test a lot of banks. So that would be like teller access, all right? Low privilege credentials and just a standard workstation. And, and basically, the, 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 the test is, what can you do w- with this access? Okay, so bad employee. I'm disgruntled. I hate this company. I want to see it burn. So what can I do? So I, I go into this company. I sit down at the workstation, and they, they, they put me down. They give me the, these low privilege credentials, and they're like, go ahead. And I'm like, all right. I have no idea what to do. Like, like no clue. I mean, I, I, I took OCP, but I'm like, I, so, so I jump on chat. I open up my laptop. I jump on chat, and I'm and I'm and I'm chatting with the, with the rest of the guys. I'm like, hey guys. So so I'm on my first job. I'm like, what do I do? And they're like, find your hacker intuition. That was all the advice I got. All right. So I'm like, all right. Great. So so I start poking around the system. Remember curiosity. Start poking around the system. I'm like, huh. I find something like this. This is interesting. Okay. So I I look at uh, I look at the local administrators group and I see the domain users is in the local administrators group. This is a big infosec no no. Remember privileged account management, one of the top three. Okay. Domain users in the local admins group. So I'm like, well, if that's the case, then I can and I'm an administrator, then I can run Mimikatz and get plain text credentials out of the system, which is exactly what I did. So I went out to the internet, I downloaded Mimikatz, I ran it, and I got a bunch of credentials. I'm like, okay, this is awesome. So I started looking at those users. One of those users also had uh, a, another user account. It was like their you know, first initial, last name, slash A. And that account was in the domain admins group. And I thought to myself, what's the likelihood that this person who has two accounts, who logged into my computer to set it up, is using the same password for their domain admin account? I'm like, no. No way. Now that's like terrible offset. No, nobody's gonna do that. So I'm like, ah, let's just check it out. So I, I, I remote desktop to their domain controller, and I put in this other user ID and put his password and lets me in. And I sit back and I'm like, <laughs> do you see what I've done? And everybody's walking past, and I'm like, <laughs> and they, they think I'm crazy, all right? Okay, and, and, and I was like, surely there has to be more to it than this. Surely there are, there are other attack vectors that are more serious, and not every company is going to have their internal security this bad. In fact, um, uh, before I, I joined Centercom, I had lunch with one of my now coworkers, and I said, uh, his name is Travis, I said, hey, hey Travis, I said, so compare the real world, he'd been doing pen testing for years, I said, compare the real world with OSCP, he's like, oh, OSCP is way harder than the real world. And I'm like, really? Are you kidding me? No, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So domain admin in like four hours. And I'm like, well, now what do I do? Okay, so over the course of the last year, been in a lot of interesting pen tests. And I'm going to tell you, one of the most serious attack vectors, and, and I know you've heard about it in other talks, but I'm going to talk about it from, from an attacker's perspective, is, is social engineering. If you are not doing due diligence in your... <laughs> are you guys playing a drinking game? <laughs> you said social engineering, drink. Yeah. So, <laughs> if you guys are not doing due diligence in terms of understanding what social engineering is, how it works, and what it can accomplish in your environment, then there's some failure happening. And I'm not just talking about phishing. Okay, phishing is great. We use phishing all the time. All right, I'm also talking about voice-based social engineering. Now, let me give you an example of voice-based social engineering. I was, I was doing an internal pen test. This is earlier in the year. I was, I was doing an internal pen test for a very large retailer. They sat me down. I was, I was inside. I said, can I use my laptop? They're like, sure. Can I use your workstation? Sure. I'm like, <laughs> goody. Now, here's the problem. This is a PCI pen test. They only gave me three days to get into their PCI environment. All right, three days is not a lot of time. You're not paying me to be stealthy. So I turned Nessus up to 11. I turned Nmap up to, you know, dash T5 insane or whatever. And I ran everything. And within like two minutes, the phone rings. And I think to myself, this, so I'm at, the only person who knows that I'm here is my security contact. And my phone's ringing. So I'm that kind of guy. I'm like, hello? 
They're like, hi, this is John from networking. Uh, are you running a port scan? Sweat. I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to lie to him. He knows what I'm doing, right? He's like, well, why? And I said, oh, well, it's just like, it's just routine maintenance, right? I couldn't even think of anything smart to say. So I was like, yeah, this is all routine. He's like, oh, this is all routine? And I said, yeah. He's like, do you mean, does that mean I can ignore all these alerts? Said, yeah. He's like, okay, great, thanks. He hangs up. In three days, I took all of their customer data and made it into their PCI environment from one of their workstations. All this person had to do was shut off the port first and then ask me questions, but they didn't. They asked me questions first and let me kind of manipulate them. Now, I say that's voice-based social engineering. That is an utterly simplistic example of what uh, voice-based social engineering is. I have other examples. I'll actually play you one uh, from an engagement just a, just a little while ago. Okay, but that, that's an example where if I can get you on the phone, I mean, I'll, I, I can send you a phishing email and you're like, oh, that's spam, delete. But if I can get you on the phone, I can send you a phishing email and then call you up and talk to you about it and I'd be all personable, okay, like you're going to hear, that's, that changes things, all right, that puts a different kind of pressure on you to act than if you just have an email in your mailbox, okay, so I'm not just talking about phishing, but uh, we're actually going to get into that, so I want to give you some statistics, these are 2014 averages, anybody here read the Verizon DBR data breach investigations report, okay, chances are you're probably familiar with this data, I can corroborate all this data, we send a lot of fish, these statistics, in, in my opinion, are absolutely true based on on the work that I personally have been doing. Okay, 77% of social engineering attacks are represented by phishing. Okay, I personally think this number is going to go down a little bit in favor of other kinds of social engineering, especially given how successful like voice-based social engineering is. Okay, 77%. 23% are the users who open the phishing message. This is about average based on what I see. Okay, of those 23%, 11, I apologize if you can't quite see it, 11%, Users who open malicious attachments. This is terrifying for reasons that, that I'm going to break down just a little bit. When you think malicious attachment, right, what do you think? Trojan, all right, yes, all right, or keylogger, all right, yes, that's true. We're actually going to dissect one of the attacks that we use, and we use it successfully, okay, in terms of a, what, what we consider to be a malicious attachment. 50% of users who open, who are going to open the message, open the message within the first hour. All right, and then finally, the statistic that as I was reading this report that, that just blew my mind, I cried for a little bit, was the users that open the message, from the time that I click send on my phishing campaign to the time emails start arriving, okay, in, in the mailboxes, the average amount of time until the first person clicks is one minute and 22 seconds. All right, if you are in charge, <laughs> if you are in charge of, of blue team, of doing enterprise defense or on email, then time is not on your side. And don't think for one minute, oh, we have proof point. Oh, we have iron port. Oh, we have all these solutions. We, attackers will find ways around it. We find ways around it every day. If I want to get a message into your mailbox with an attachment, I can do it. Okay, so I'm not saying throw those solutions out. Remember, I don't want to leave you hopeless. I'm not saying throw the solutions out because those solutions do a great job protecting like everyday drive-by download type stuff, okay? Don't throw that stuff out. Keep it, but just understand if I want in your company and phishing is the attack avenue that I want to use, I will be able to get past your spam filter. Remember, I'm approaching this from a determined intruder standpoint, not, you know, Nigerian prince phishing kind of thing, okay? So let's actually, uh, I want to dive into some examples. Examples that you may have seen and then examples that we actually use. The first one, remember the RSA breach, our RSA breach from uh, 2011? This is the, the email that got the attackers into RSA. There is nothing sophisticated about this. In fact, you can see it is from, laser pointer, it is from webmaster at beyond.com, because that's not suspicious, going to somebody at EMC. And all it says is, I forward this to you for review. Please open and view it. That's it. Okay, the attachment 2011 recruitment plan.xls, if memory serves, that contained in Adobe Flash zero day. <laughs> There's a surprise. So, all right, so what happened was the email came in and it found its way into some dude's junk folder. And this guy decided he's going to go back and review his junk folder. So he looks into his junk folder. He's like, oh, somebody sent me an attachment. Let's open it. 
That, that's, that's exactly how the foothold was established. Okay, this is one that I sent, uh, I don't know, a month ago, two months ago, as part of continuing expense reduction plan. This spreadsheet contains Q2 salary adjustments going into effect the first pay period in May. Who would not be interested to see that? Right, and of course, I'm just mimicking Citrix share file because I'm, I'm sending it to you securely, right? So it's, it's secure. So you, you go into that spreadsheet and you open it up. You start scrolling on the list. You're like, shoot, there's my name. My salary's getting adjusted. Well, I, what's it being adjusted to? I can't, everything says enable content. You panic, you click enable content, right? So what happens when you click enable content? Something runs behind the scenes and this is exactly what runs behind the scenes, All right? I hope you can see this. What you see at the very top, this is just some VB script or VBA script. All this does is this kicks off a WMI process. And then what you are, what I want you to focus on is this line right here. We're going to create a process, PowerShell.exe. Window style hidden, execution policy bypass, because we can do that. Scope current user, no logo, no profile. And then we're going to download this file. And we're going to run this command called IEX. IEX stands for invoke expression. Invoke expression says run whatever you get. Okay, so download this file and then run it. Now, what does this file do? Well, all this file does is kick off something called invoke shellcode. Invoke shellcode sends back a interpreter shell to my evil uh, IP address on port 443. Now, if you are an intrepid enterprise defender, you are thinking to yourself right now, well, <laughs> we don't let our users download files. In fact, we, ju we, were, we were just on a test where the users, everyday users were not allowed to download files. Okay, or, I mean, I'm not going to let a user download a PS1 file that's evil. Okay, so you're thinking to yourself, I already have controls in place for this. Actually, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm not actually going to demo the attack. I, I do want to show you um, right here. I don't know if you guys can see that. I was actually mocking this up just a couple hours ago. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Over, over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, good grief. I was mocking this up just a couple hours ago. This is actually a campaign that I'm going to run on Monday. If you're my customer, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm, so if you take a look at this, all, so basically the exact same attack vector, except I'm using what's called an HTA, an HTML application file. So uh, you go out to my evil website. In fact, I'm not even going to phish him. I'm, I'm not even going to send a phishing email unless I have to. I'm going to call him. And my attack vector is going to be like, hey, uh, uh, you are one of like 10 people left that have yet to download and install our new uh, client software. Can you just take a minute? I'll walk you through the whole process. Can you just go out to this website and download it? You got this website, the software automatically runs, but what executes is this stuff. Okay, so, shoot. Uh, number one, all, all we're doing is I'm creating a bunch of shell objects, and then I'm kicking off a bunch of PowerShell encoded stuff. Number one, this first command is going to uh, run a WMI command that is going to look at all of your program files and then post them out to my web server. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to see all the programs you, that you have installed and then it's going to come back to my web server. Why is this important? Because now I know what kind of antivirus you're running. Now I, have to, now I know what I have to bypass. Are you running HIDs? Are you running, uh, what kind of local security stuff are you running? Do you have uh, Office running? All things that are very, very helpful for an attacker to know. And then this one here is going to send off a shell to a uh, server in uh, uh, Amazon. And this one is going to send back a shell back to my internal box. So on different ports, using different protocols, just because I don't know what kind of security controls you have. So I'm, I'm going to kick off these three attack vectors just, just because I can. This is not necessarily extraordinarily complicated code. I mean, if you look at this, what is that? 11 lines of code? That's it. That's, that's all this is. Okay, this is not terribly complicated. All right, and if you think to yourself, I have AV. <sighs> AV does not catch this. Okay, 0 of 60. Uh, we'll catch this. All right, just keep that in mind. So, where are we? Where the heck is my mouse? There it is. All right. How would you defend against something like this? Defenders in the crowd? Put your, put your thingy hats on. How would you defend against this? Shoot. Yeah. This one? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep, you do not. Now, I'm banking on something. And I'm banking on the fact that you are letting your users run PowerShell, that you're letting your, your non-administrator users run PowerShell, which is Microsoft out-of-the-box functionality. Very, very few companies shut off PowerShell. And the reason why is because they want to do their sysadmin stuff to sysadmin the machine, right? So, but let's think about this for a second. How would you block this? How would you turn that off? 
Okay, AV, I guarantee you right now, AV includes exceptions for PowerShell. Why? Because it's Microsoft sanctioned. It's safe, right? Right? Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna abuse PowerShell. So if if you're an enterprise defender, how would you defend against this? Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm hmm. So, yep. So what that will do is that will cause me to have to try again, because what I what I don't know going into this engagement is I don't know if they're proxying. I don't know what ports they're blocking, and we just, <laughs> I'll tell you a hilarious story a little later about a company that we tested just a couple weeks ago, that they were proxying everything and not letting us their users download anything. All right, and that was, that was just a treat. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's a hilarious story. I can't wait to tell you that one. But uh, a, proxy, a proxy would slow me down. It's not going to stop me. It would slow me down because I don't necessarily know what the ports are. So if you kick this off, so the, 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 uh, uh, on line number six, that payload is going out across port 443, and on line number seven, I've already done a little bit of research on the company. I know that they are allowing outbound on port 25 for SMTP. So, right? Okay, so you have to assume that I'm going to be able to get a reverse connection back. All right? It's, it's rare that we see the company that actually does a really, really solid job uh, proxying or egress filtering. Okay? How would you stop that? Here's the way I can, here's the way I can think of. Use AppLocker to stop PowerShell.exe. All right, and I know you, you might panic over this, but here's the thing, under what circumstance would a non-administrator have to run PowerShell on their machine? If you are moving your login script to PowerShell, God help you, because everybody has to run it, so that what I just told you will not work, all right? But if you are not using PowerShell for your login script, consider AppLocker, consider software restriction policy, something to actually block PowerShell.exe for non-administrators. Now, as an attacker, I know ways around that. But here's the thing. In order to get around that, I have to drop another binary onto your system in order to execute that binary to execute my malicious PowerShell code. It makes the attack much more complicated. This will stop the, the kind of attack that I'm showing you right now, okay, blocking PowerShell.exe. And we write this up as a finding for the vast majority of our customers because they're like, it's PowerShell. It's good. I need it. I'm a sysadmin. I love it. We like, we love it too. And we took all your data because you, because we love it, okay? So, moving on. Uh, here's a, this one is interesting. This is a, a, a fish that I sent out to uh, uh, customers. This was, I, I don't know, probably a month or two ago. Oh, this is just a standard default eFax email. Now, there's nothing magical about this. If you click on, uh, click here to view the message, you get taken to a web page that has an attack vector just like what I showed you. All right? So you click on it, and you're like, open, allow. Yeah, I want my message. And then I have a shell. Okay, so... What I want, the reason why I'm telling you this is because I'm not going to send something like this to you rockstar sysadmins. I'm going to send it to your salespeople. Why? Because a sysadmin is going to get this and be like, spam, I don't use eFax, nobody uses eFax, delete. But your salespeople are going to be thinking to themselves, oh, shoot, somebody thinks I'm awesome. And they're sending me an application. And an application with a signature means commission. So this, your salespeople are going to translate this to money. And so when I sent this as a fish, it, this, this literally took me like an hour or two to mock up. I sent this to a bunch of salespeople, 75% of the users clicked it. 75%. Okay? <laughs> like, good grief. So I, a, a company hired us, a large retailer hired us to do a, a phishing campaign for them. They said, you know what? We're going to give you the template that we want you to use for the phishing email. I'm like, great. I don't have to mock it up. Fine. So they give me this template. And I look at this template, and I just laughed. I'm like, nobody is going to click it. This is what they gave me. What is wrong with this email? And I will give you a hint. It's not the deliberate misspelling. Have a look. See the logo? FedEx. Who is it from? <laughs> so I, I see this email. I'm like, are you, are you guys kidding me? Nobody's going to click this. Why are we even doing this? 11% of people clicked it. <laughs> I'm not making this up. 11% clicked it. Okay. Here's an interesting story. This is one that I actually, uh, I, I tested a company. Their security team was in the blind. They had no idea they were being tested. I was working with their audit company. All right. Long and short of this says, uh, I, I knew about a merger that they were going through because it was on their website. All right. Knew about a merger, and I said, well, we have to change VPN to accommodate all the new connections. Click here to verify your credentials. When you click here to verify the credentials, you are taken out to a, a cloned web page. We call it credential harvesting. You're taken out to a clone web page. looks just like your web page for your, your two-factor VPN. You put in your username, you put in your passcode, and you put in your password. 
and you click submit because you want to verify. And it just says, thank you, your credentials have been submitted, and now I have them. Okay, so in this case, th I had three credentials, only three. Two users submitted a username and password, but no passcode, which I later found out they didn't have a token. So I'm like, why are you trying to connect to VPN if you don't even have a token, but you gave me your password? Whatever. So another, per another user clicked it. She submitted her username, she submitted her password, and then she submitted her passcode. And it was in, it was in a format that I, that I recognized. And I was like, okay, I, I know what's going on. So now I know this user is a two-factor user. All right, I had tried every other way to get into this company, and, and it was not working. Okay, so this was my attack vector. So I, I found um, Outlook Web Access, and I was like, let me try username and password. I tried username and password, didn't work. It's like it said, it said unauthorized access. Now, I kind of screwed up because I sent the campaign at like 7 in the morning, and then I went and got breakfast. Okay, meanwhile, users are clicking stuff, they're submitting forms, I'm eating bacon and eggs. The sysadmin is freaking out because they got fished. They found out who all the users were. They clicked the message and submitted their credentials and said, everybody change your password. So they changed their password immediately. So I was like, hats off to them for doing a great job. Okay, so I had a username. I had a password, but it didn't work. Now, this is the form factor of her password. And she changed it. And I know she changed it, or her account was disabled because of the Outlook Web Access message. It said unauthorized access. So I'm, I look at this password, and I'm like, what are the odds? that she changed it to something else. Anyone want to take a guess what she changed it to? Somebody said it. Two, three, four, five. Bam. So I go out to Outlook Web Access. I, I got a username. I try your password. All right. And it's, it, it did not let me into Outlook Web Access. It just said, welcome. Your mailbox has not been set up. I was like, ooh. Now I know I have a valid username and password, but I don't have a passcode. Okay. So here's what I did wrong. All right, I'm not afraid of, you know, airing my dirty laundry. Here's what I did wrong. When I set up the fake domain, I forgot, I, you can change the, uh, the registrar information, the, the contact information on that domain. And I always change it to, like, Miles Dyson of Cyberdyne Systems and, you know. The, <laughs> and so I forgot to click change it on all the contact types. There's the admin contact type and the technical contact type. I, for, I forgot to change it on all of them. And so the company did a Whois lookup, found it, and sent me an email. And here's what they said, Jason, uh, somebody on our security team kind of figured out that it's you and we had to disclose that it's a pen test. So can you just be a little more stealthy? She, she said this to me. I was like, are you telling me to try harder? So now I'm pissed. All right. And so I, so I asked her, I was like, I was like can, I, can I call your user? And, she's like, and, and the, my contact was like, well, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can call her. I was like, is it okay if I call her under pretext to try and get information out of her? She's like, well, she's not going to give you a password. I'm like, I already have her password. <laughs> I was like, just, is it okay with you? Like, can you respond back in writing that I can call? I'm like, yeah, sure. So she sends me an email, and I'm like, sweet. And I recall the story, I, I recall the lesson that my son taught me. My three, I have a three-year-old son. His name is James. All right? And, and he's the cutest little, you know, blonde mop for hair. And he's like, runs around. He's like a wild man. Okay? Well, one day, J James has a pair of uh, uh, black spandex, uh, like long johns. And he was running around in these, in the, we call it his ninja suit. He was running around in these, in these black spandex and he had a little toy sword and mud puddle boots. And he's running around, so he's, he's out in the front yard and he's on the, on the front sidewalk and, and he's, he's, he, he blocks the front sidewalk like this. He spreads his legs, he sticks his hands out like this. All right, my wife is approaching the sidewalk and my son, my three-year-old son, wants to say, stop, what's the password? But it comes out like this, pop, what's the iPad? And my wife is like, I don't know, what is it? And, and, and he says, E-I-E-I-O. And she said, E-I-E-I-O. Um, e and James said, okay, go ahead. So what's the moral of the story? If you want to know the password, ask. <laughs> this, this is what I learned from my three-year-old son. Okay, oh, by, by the way, pff, boom, there he is. Stand there, psh, stop, pop, what's the iPad? All right, so I was like, okay, so, so I, I need to call this user and see if I can somehow solicit the user's pin code. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play you. EIO security. I'm proud of that. I'm going to play you the actual phone call. Uh, uh, we, we recorded the call of when I called the user. I'm going to quiz you at the end. Now, before, I have to kind of frame this a little bit. So uh, uh, I call up the user. The first thing she does is put me on hold. And I later found out she was verifying caller ID. Now, we use technology called spoof card, which means I can spoof any caller ID I want. So I spoof the home office. Okay. So um, uh, I called this user. And here's, here's what I didn't know at the time. They had two two-factor VPN solutions, one on this URL and one on this URL. And I had no idea which one was right. No clue. So you're going to hear me try and 
figure that out during the call. Okay, and I'm, I'm going, so I apologize in advance for the beeps, I had to redact some stuff. So, but I'm going to ask you at the end a few questions about this, okay? So here we go, cross fingers. I apologize if this is way too loud. Sorry about that, I just had something in my desk. No, 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 no problem at all. I'm just hoping I take up one minute. Um, what I had to do was, uh, we've been told to call everybody who's been, who's been targeted as part of the attack and make some changes to their VPN accounts so that it's a little more secure so that when they, when they get logged in, it's not so easy for an attacker to uh, target some of our users. So what I want to do is I want to take, I don't know, just a couple minutes and make a couple changes to your VPN account, but I need you to verify your PIN code. I don't need your password, but I do need your PIN code. Is that something that you have, that you have time to work with me on? Do you have your token with you by chance? My, my VPN PIN code. Hmm. I don't know what my Like, when, what, when, you, when you pull up your token, you should get prompted to put in a password, and then it should give you a code that you used to put into the website. Oh, yeah, you know yeah. What so I'm that, about? So the, uh, the token that's on my phone. Yes. Yep. Okay. And who am I speaking with now that I'm all paranoid? Was... No, no, no. And, and, and you should be. <laughs> you totally should that's be. That's why I put you in all of them. Like, this is our, our, our phone number, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, and I never, I never opened all those emails, and I was like so proud of myself because I, I never typically, I was so close to the branch that I typically never use the whole VPN thing, and I just had done it like a couple weeks before, and then I'm like, sure, now the one time I'm thinking I'm in the good. Right. <laughs> so let, let me ask you this question: We're we're in the middle of cutting over users to a new VPN solution. Are you using the old one or the new one? So the old one, you go out. To New one is which one are you using? I don't know because I only use it. Wait a second, I go through. You know what is I mean? it the one? It does it have the black background with a pretty looking blue lock, or does it have a white background? I, you know, I, I honestly have only used it like probably once. Okay. Um. So no, no problem. No problem. No problem. What I'm what I'm going to do then is I'm going to test it in both systems just to make sure if that's okay with you. Yeah, it's fine. So, okay. What, like I said, I don't need your username or anything like that. I I just need um the 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 passcode that you would put in. It's probably going to be a six or seven uh, digit number. Okay, so I I just pulled it up. So you want me to give it to you? Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's Alrighty, I am good to go. Thank you so much. No problem. Y your account has been changed, so you should be squared away. Okay, great. Thank you. You have a great holiday. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye. Why did that work? Why did that work? What What was so... What, what, yeah, go ahead. Uh, that, yes, number one, I asked. I told her exactly what I needed. Yep. Oh, 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 that's so good. You're always trying to be helpful. Yes. She, she verified who I was. So, yes, she did. Number one, she verified the number. Number two, she verified a name. She asked who I was. Now, I had already found an assistant admin on LinkedIn. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so what, I'm, I'm looking for something specific. Anybody else? Why, why, why did that work? Yeah. I was nice to her. You bet. You bet. I was friendly. I didn't call her up and be like, give me your password. I'm going to bomb your house. I mean, I was, I was nice about it, right? Okay. What... There's one thing that I did, and I planned this. I, in fact, I even rehearsed this. I said, I don't want your password, all right? I don't want your password. I already, I already have your password. I don't want your password. I'm confirming your internal security practices, okay? I don't want you to break your internal security policy. I'm here to help you, okay? Keep in mind when that stuff happens. Now, now the good news is that for her, she actually called the, uh, the, the CISO, and the CISO was like, I can't believe you did that, and they disabled all remote access. So I have to tip my hat to them, because the minute I got in, uh, I had to like download the, the, the Citrix client, it took me forever, and I was, I was mad. So the minute I got in, everything was disabled. This company had the right response, and they shut down all external access. All right, but that, that's, the, what, what is the defense to that? How would, how would you, how would she have possibly defended against something like that? What's that? Oh man, that happened to me not not a week ago. A user is like, "Yeah, can I call you back? What's your extension?" I'm like, "Uh, I'm not at my desk." Bye. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, perfect. Uh, another thing, how how, how else to defend against that? You you nailed it. You said we users are trained to be helpful. We teach our users 
a thousand ways to say yes, especially a customer service representative who this was, okay, a thousand ways to say yes and not one corporate sanctioned way to say no, not one. What? Of course she's going to say yes. She's, she's afraid for a job. She's, she wants to help customers. She wants to help people, right? All she had to do was say, I'm sorry, who's your manager? I'd be like, John Smith. I don't know. Who's your director? Where's the break room? I, I, have, I, I don't know. All she had to do was ask me one piece of information that was internal and specific to that company. I would have had no idea. Okay? Let's talk about some of this. Security control wins and fails. So based on this, what, what are some lessons? What, what are some takeaways for something like this? All right. And by the way, the, the perspective I'm coming from, I know I'm running short of time, the perspective I'm coming from is the, the perspective of a determined intruder. Not all of the controls that I'm going to talk about suck. Some of them are good, okay? But they're not necessarily going to stop me. What's a good one? Network access control. If you have network access control, and I don't just mean like choke points, I'm talking about NAC down to your workstations, you're doing it right. Okay, if I'm going to do an internal pen test, and, and I have to get a Dropbox on your network, and you have NAC, I have to do something like say, well, well can you put it in your data center? Because I'm not going to be able to get to anything. All right, so that, that ups the ante right there. Number two, security awareness training. The companies that hire us to do quarterly phishing, we, we send out four fishes a year to a bunch of users. We have seen dramatic drops in the, in the percentage of the click-through, the, the click-through rate. Okay, security awareness training, and I, and I don't just mean computer-based training. If you're doing that, you're doing it wrong. Okay, I'm talking about offensive security awareness training. Okay, stuff that is actually going to be made personable to the user. If you fail, and you, you should be allowed to fail, we're going to tell you why. Okay, number three, frequent patching. This one is absolutely obvious. Number four, account management, least privilege. Remember, remember domain users? So we actually did a pen test not, not two weeks ago. Uh, where uh, we, we, were, we were trying to get into a very, very large billion dollar organization. They're like, we don't, we don't think you're going to get in. So we fished our way in and we're on, we have uh, low privilege credentials on, on one workstation across DNS. And we're like, well, now what do we do? So we start, we start looking around. Okay. And I ran a script. The script's called Invoke Share Finder. It's from uh, Power Tools, Invoke Share Finder. All this, all this script does is it crawls the environment looking to see if the user's an administrator anywhere. Okay. We found a machine. This machine turned out to be a server. The server was an application server, so we migrated to the application server because we had administrator rights, and we started looking around, and we're like, what's on this server? Oh, well, here's the Visa directory. Here's the ACH directory. We ended the engagement with a movie that was scrolling credit cards past the screen, okay? All because we were able to pivot to that system, okay? The, yeah, this company was not happy when we, when we actually told them, all right? So let's talk about some fails, antivirus. If you think AV is going to protect you from me, it won't. All right, for all the reasons that I just stated, I'm going to use stuff that's going to evade AV. I'm going to generate code dynamically for which there is no signature. I'm not saying AV is bad. I'm just saying that in the case of a determined intruder, it's not going to stop me. It'll slow me down, but it won't stop me. Keep that in mind. Number two, DLP. If you are using DLP, um, it is most likely not going to work if you hire us to exfiltrate your data. The reason being is not that necessarily DLP is a bad solution, DLP, data loss prevention. It's just that it is generally so neutered in order to get it into production that it's useless. Okay? DLP is not going to stop data from leaving your company. In, in most cases, again, determine intruder. Number three, trusting the audit. If you think that uh, checking the security compliance checkbox is going to save you, it won't. All, all an audit does, an audit specifies the floor of security. A pen test defines your ceiling and it raises that ceiling, okay? And the last one is whatever latest Blinky Light solution you have purchased, okay? <laughs> there, there's only a very, very few that I can actually think of. A lot of companies think, oh, it's the perimeter. We put our firewalls on the perimeter and, then, and, and our perimeter is secure. You can buy whatever you want. If I can fish my way in, remember, I'm gonna pass your, your, your spam filter, okay? If, if you put all of your hope in whatever appliance it is that you just bought, you're gonna be sorely disappointed. A tight security configuration will beat a fancy appliance 10 times out of 10. What do I mean by tight security? I'm talking about stupid, easy, obvious things like making sure domain users is not in the local administrators group. I'm talking about having a tight group policy that is applied to your domain controllers and your domain. I'm talking about a password policy that's greater than five characters, greater than 15 characters, okay? If I'm talking about things that are generally so obvious and overlooked, that, that people are like, well, we can't do that because we'll break access to the mainframe if we have password policy greater than eight characters. I'm, I'm sorry, then you're going to get, it's going to be the apocalypse. All right. So wrapping up, 
pen test on ramp. If you're interested in getting a pen test, this will be the, this, these are my personal recommendations to you. Learn how to code anything. PowerShell, Python, C, VBScript, doesn't matter what it is. Figure out how that code works. Okay. If you're not a curious person, don't get into pen testing. If, uh, uh, find something in technology that you love and get good at it. Uh, maybe you're a Raspberry Pi person. Maybe you love Windows. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Find out what your passion is and get it to it and then go, go for some training. That's all I had. Any questions? I probably don't, I probably have zero time for questions. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no. Do you want them? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great question. So the question was, uh, the gentleman was thinking about standing up a red team, but wants to know, should we do an internal red team versus an external penetration test? Uh, from my perspective, I like internal red teams. Uh, you get people that are very, very familiar with the environment and they can actually, the, the penetration can go a little bit deeper. Uh, sorry, because, well, be, be, oh, only because the familiarity with the environment increases. Now the downside about that is then that, that they become jaded. All right, that's all they know how to focus on. And there's, this is where the benefit of hiring an external does. So if you're going to stand for red team, I would say go for it, but do not, not get an external pen test as well. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, social, uh, uh, security awareness training. They, they have to do security awareness training. You have to train your users. You have to train your users. You have to train your users in terms of how to recognize a phishing email and how to recognize a fraudulent phone call and then give them an action plan in terms of what to do with it. Okay. But in terms of what to focus on, what, um, uh, once I can fish your environment, I'm going to start moving around laterally. Okay. So I would focus on things like log aggregation. Are you, are you pulling your logs back and actually combing through them to see who's logging into what? Okay. We actually just talked about, uh, uh, the previous speaker just talked about this. So, you know, that's something that I would definitely focus on is pulling your logs into one place and actually evaluating those logs as well. Okay. Otherwise, uh, most companies ignore internal pen tests. They, they want, they want a perimeter. I tell all customers get an internal pen test because once I fish my way into your environment, it is now an internal pen test. Okay. So I, I think I'm, I, 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 I might see more questions. I know I'm just about out of time. So please find me afterwards. Um, I want, I did want to poll you guys. Uh, we're thinking about doing a, 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 a derby con talk where we take all the tools that we've written over pen testing for the last year, blue team and red team tools, and just throw them out there. Would any of you be interested in a talk like that? All right. All right. Cool. Absolutely. Thank you. That's it. That's all I had. Thank you very much. <laughs>